All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton, and our next guest is Mohamed Sahimi, professor of chemical engineering at USC, writer for PBS Frontline's Tehran Bureau website, and also antiwar.com. Welcome back, Mohamed. How are you doing? Uh, thank you for having me in your program again. It's, it's good to talk talking to you again. Well, I'm very happy to have you here, and I don't mind a little redundancy. I hope you don't. I think we're pretty much agreed that among the most important issues on the planet is that people know the truth about Iran's nuclear program, especially as opposed to the lies told by the war party, which is growing. Um, and so uh, I was hoping we could just go through this uh, IAEA report piece by piece and uh, see you know, what actually has weight here, whether any of those weeks worth of scaremongering we heard before the report came out were justified or not. So um, I guess, first of all, if you could break it into categories, the different accusations in this IAEA report, obviously there's uh, the alleged studies documents uh, accusations, which I guess I would categorize as one group. And then there are these new accusations about a Ukrainian former Soviet scientist and his role perhaps in helping them develop implosion systems this kind of thing how exactly would you break it down and then let's go ahead and go through the different sections the way you well, like it well i mean first of all the the report itself was divided into two parts the first part was about iran's known nuclear facilities and how they are operating and so on and the iaea uh, says that it certifies once again that there has been no diversion of nuclear material from peaceful to non-peaceful. But even here, when it, desert, uh, uh, when it certifies that, it, first of all, makes uh, unsubstantiated uh, claims and also makes unreasonable demands. First of all, the report, since Yukio Amano became Director General of IAEA, always refers to Iran's undeclared nuclear material. If Iran does have undeclared nuclear material, which there is no evidence for it whatsoever, and even the report does not offer a shred of it, it would be a major violation of Iran's obligation towards its safeguard agreements. But the fact of the matter is the IAEA just refers to such materials without presenting a shred of evidence why it thinks that Iran might have undeclared nuclear material. So that's one part. The other part is when it refers to heavy water uh, uh, plant in Iraq and says that Iran does not allow us to visit the heavy water plant. First of all, IAEA has visited that plant in the past and has taken sample. And secondly, and most importantly, something that most people don't know is that a heavy water plant is not included and covered by Iran's safeguards agreement with the IAEA. In fact, heavy water is not considered a nuclear material unless there is a heavy water reactor that uses that heavy water. And Iran doesn't have a heavy water reactor. Iran is building one, but most experts believe that this plant will not come online at least by 2014 or 2015, if not later. So in that context, Iran has no obligation whatsoever to allow IAEA to visit the plant, even though it has done so in the past. So that's the first part. Then the second part discusses the possible um, military dimension of Iran's nuclear program. And it is here that it makes many allegations. Most of them don't hold any water. First of all, all the allegations without the report acknowledging it, it are based on the on the laptop that allegedly was stolen in Iran in 2004, taken to Turkey and given to Western intelligence agencies. Every one of them is based on that. And then in February of 2008, when Ali Hainonen, who was at that time the Deputy Director General for, uh, for Safeguards, made a presentation to the Board of Governors just two days after Mohammed al-Baradi reported that all the outstanding issues between Iran and IAEA had been resolved to, to the IAEA satisfaction, in which uh, Heinonen used the laptop documents, supposedly, to you know, draw a very dark uh, uh, image or picture of what's going on in Iran and made all sorts of allegations. Now, if we compare 
the uh, the latest IAEA report with what uh, Ali Heinonen said at that time, we find that they are exactly the same. Heinonen talked about Project 5, Project 110, Project 111, and Project 3.5, and the present report also talks about the same thing, uh, which is in the attachment one in, at the end of uh, at the end of the report. So, and here. The IAEA makes several allegations. First of all, it makes allegations that a, a foreign scientist helped Iran between 1996 and early 2000. And now we know that that scientist was a Russian or Ukrainian scientist, and all the allegations have collapsed basically simply because the guy is not a nuclear physicist or a nuclear engineer. He worked in, in, in an institute where uh, work on nuclear weapons was done, but his work was... Uh, not related to it. Since 1960, uh, he has worked on production of nanodiamonds that have applications in medicine and material science and, and, and other, uh, other things. Supposedly, the only thing, the only connections that um, may uh, establish some sort of relation between pro uh, production of nanodiamonds and a nuclear weapon program is that in both of them, you need to use explosion in order to do what you want to do. But the explosion that one uses in for production of nanodiamonds is nowhere close to the explosion that one has in, in, in triggering a nuclear reaction uh, in, in a nuclear nuclear warhead. So that's the that's the, basically the gist of it. And uh, as you know, and by now everybody who follows this knows. Uh, Garrett Porter's and Moon in Alabama and other 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 sources and and, and people have basically uh, uh, to torn this this allegation apart. Although I must say that yesterday David Albright's uh, uh, Institute Institute for Science and International Security issued a statement again uh, the, the defending what it had claimed because Albright was the main person who propagated this idea that. Uh, the, the Russian or Ukrainian guy was uh, could be or could have uh, Iran uh, the nuclear program, even though the guy himself was was interviewed by a Russian newspaper, and he he told the Russian newspaper that I didn't do any nuclear work for Iran, and I'm not a father of nu Iran's nuclear program. So that was one main allegation that it made. The IAEA also made allegations about high explosives. Again, this goes back several years. In 2005. And 2006, the IAEA made, uh, 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 you know, some allegations about Iran experimenting with high explosives at a facility called Parchin in southeast Tehran. Now, Parchin is a facility that Iran has used since 1950s to produce ammunition for its, uh, uh, you know, conventional arms. The allegation was that Iran was uh, was uh, using the facility to experiment for, with high explosives that are not only used in conventional warheads and conventional weapons, but also for triggering a nuclear reaction. So uh, uh, the IAEA asked Iran to visit the site. Iran resisted at the beginning because it said, and, and rightly so, that the parching facility is not a nuclear facility and therefore is not covered by Iran's safeguard agreements. But after, after some time, it allowed... The, uh, it allowed the uh, uh, IAEA inspectors to go in and look at everything. They apparently had some satellite imagery that indicated that Iran may have built a, a steel container. A steel container is used in such experiments in order to, to control and contain the high explosion that is caused by high explosives. They went in there, they couldn't find anything. Even Ali Heinonen said that they couldn't find anything. And in fact, I just read a report in, in one of Iranian websites published in Iran that detailed uh, the visit that was made in 2005 or 2006, in, in which he said that after they visited the, uh, the, the site, Heinonen or one of his deputies asked the Iranian government to allow them to look at two other sites that hadn't been listed as, you know, as, as being visited, and the Iranian government allow, allowed them to do it. In other words, they just did it on their spot, and they couldn't find anything. All right, now hold it right there. I'm sorry, Sahami. Okay. Uh, Muhammad, we have to go out to this break. I said your name's in the wrong order, but you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> Tay Ron Bureau, PBS Frontline, antiwar.com, Muhammad Singh. We'll be right back after this. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Muhammad Sahimi from uh, USC. He's a professor of chemical engineering there, and he writes for... Uh, PBS Frontline Tehran Bureau. 
Just search Tehran Bureau. It'll come right up for you. He's also got an archive, very important one, at antiwar.com. And we're talking about the uh, new IAEA report. And uh, Mohammed just did a great job. If you missed it, sorry, uh, before the break, breaking down what all's in there and why not to consider it so important. If I can summarize real quick, the first part is, oh, yeah, they don't have any fissile material. The only uranium they have is at a measly 3.6%, a little bit at 20%, and it's all accounted for. And there's been <clears throat> no diversion. They are verified to have not diverted any of their uranium to any military purpose. So anything else we're talking about is just, uh, you know, side work uh, from there at best. Uh, then, uh, Mohammed, you said uh, a, a major portion of these accusations is the same old so-called smoking laptop, which I hope we can get into the details of that a little bit more uh, about uh, where it came from and uh, how trusted it is, and even what the accusations in it are and how well they hold up to scrutiny. Um, and then uh, there's the accusations about the Ukrainian scientists helping them with their implosion program and how there's this metal building at Parchin that must be for testing implosion systems for nuclear weapons, even though, uh, as you say, they've been testing weapons there, conventional ones, for a long time. And even Oli Heinonen, the hawk, the former hawk, from the IAEA, who's now, I think, at Harvard, uh, told David Sanger, who went ahead and included it in his story in the New York Times, that, now nah, I've been there, and uh, or my guys have been there, and uh, found uh, not one click of radiation, so don't worry about that. Um, and now, uh, I'm not sure if there was an exact uh, important point we needed to pick up on the other side of this break where we left off, or if you want to go ahead and rewind now, we can talk a little bit about uh, the origin and uh, the contents of this so-called smoking laptop. No, be, be, before we get to that, I, I would like to um, make one more point regarding to those high explosives. Okay. The IAEA report says that in 2008, Iran informed the agency that it has developed a, a detonator for high explosives. Now, det, a, a, a detonator is used, of course, for triggering high explosives. It, it, it has uh, civilian applications in many, many uh, areas. It has conventional military application, and of course, uh, a, a particular type of it can also be used for uh, uh, triggering a, a nuclear reaction. Now, Iranian scientists had worked on it and had published in open journal about it, and Iran itself approached the IAEA in 2008 to let them know that they have done it, even though they, they, were, not, uh, they, they were not obligated to. And now IAEA turns this around and makes allegations about it. And, and what it says is that Iran hasn't informed us what it wants to do with this. In other words, Iran not only is supposed to let them know that they have been doing it uh, from the IAEA point of view, but also has to explain what it, you know, what it wants to do with it, which is, you know, in my view, is totally nonsense. When a country approaches IAEA and says, we've done this and we want to do this and because it has civilian application and so on, then there should be no, there is no point of contention or no point of argument, and yet the, the latest report again makes a big argument about this. Or regarding even high explosive conventional arms, the IA report itself acknowledges that because Iran has a, Iran has a conventional missile program and produces its own missile, it, it is possible that if Iran did do some experiments on high explosives, for which it doesn't present any evidence, it is related to Iran's conventional uh, the, uh, mis missile program. But at the same time, IAEA expresses concern that, well, this might be related to 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 uh, you know to nuclear material it's just like saying i express my concern about banks because although banks are used for you know fully uh, you know legitimate transactions but they can also be used for mo money laundering uh, they they just don't go together people don't just close banks because it it, it could be used for money laundering uh, the other aspect of it is that for example it says that iran uh, Iranian scientists work on neutron transport. And, of course, neutron transport is relevant to nuclear weapons. But, again, they have worked on modeling of nuclear transport, 
and they had published it in open journals, open access journals. So if they wanted to do something related to nuclear material or nuclear weapon and didn't want the world to know about it, why would they go out and, and write their paper and publish in peer-reviewed scientific journals and let the whole world know that they are, they are working on this, type of, on, on this type of problems? This just doesn't you know, satisfy any uh, a standard or criterion for credibility as far as the, as, as far as the report is concerned. And then, uh, as, as we said before the break, all of these, or at least most of it, are based on that laptop. The laptop was supposedly stolen from Iran in 2004 and brought outside Iran and taken to Turkey. Now, a lot of people have written about this. Garrett Porter had a great report about this. But here is the essence of, the, uh, essence of it. A laptop supposedly existed. Now, whether that laptop was stolen from Iran is a matter of contention. I don't believe there was was such a laptop in Iran. It was a laptop with this document that, that were fabricated most likely by Mossad Israel intelligence agencies. It is known that uh, these agents approached uh, Iranian opposition, offered them to go public with the documents that supposedly were on the laptop. They first approached Iranian monarchies, uh, who live, for example, here in Southern California in large numbers, but the Iranian monarchies refused to go public with it because they thought, first of all, it's forgery, and second, even if it's true, since the Iran's nuclear program was started by the United States ally, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, during 1970s, the monarchies actually supported the nuclear program, and they didn't want to go public with it. Then they approached the MEK, and MEK, Mujahideen Khalq Organization, got the documents, and uh, uh, started to uh, uh, spread words, uh, words around it. But there are so many things about, this, about the documents uh, in the laptop that just so abnormal, if, if the laptop actually exists, that, that uh, it just doesn't have any credibility. For example, there are things in it, uh, in, in the document, according to information that have become available, that are supposedly very sensitive, but, for example, doesn't, don't have any seal of classified or secret or for your eyes only and so on. Now, people like me who are from Iran know the culture of Iran, know that Iran is a sort of a secretive society. Even the uh, most uh, normal, the most, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the most ordinary things are classified by the Iranian government. Now, why such sensitive materials were not classified uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, labeled secret or classified or for your eyes only is, is, is totally beyond me. Now, the other thing is, why, is, why should a government that has uh, supposedly works on nuclear weapons put all these sensitive documents uh, according to IAEA report, is about a thousand page on one laptop, and that lap laptop was just sitting around, uh, and somebody just went went there and just picked it up and uh, could leave the building wherever that building was. Most likely, if if this was a, a true case, it was somewhere in Ministry of Defense or Atomic Energy Organization of Iran. So he just pick up the laptop and left the building. Nobody, nobody uh, uh, realized that. And then he also had enough time to actually get it out of Iran. And we know Minister of in Intelligence in Iran is, is a very uh, highly efficient organization. This is something that even Israelis have acknowledged. And, uh, and, uh, but the guy still had uh, time to leave Iran and take the laptop and take also Iran and make it available. But even aside from all of this, in, a, in an article that I uh, uh, published uh, on antiwar.com a couple of years ago, I asked a simple question. I said, if the laptop actually exists and was taken out of Iran, let's do a simple test. There is a test called digital uh, chain of custody. In other words, you can uh, easily test a computer and see the documents that are on that computer when they were uploaded in that computer and when they were inserted in that computer. So if that computer exists and it, it contains a thousand pages of secret documents about Iran's nuclear program, why don't we just do a test like that? But not only that test has never been done, the computer has never been made public. Its documents have, have never been presented to Iran even a copy of them, the only thing that have been made available to Iran are summary of what those documents say, and then Iran have been asked to, to explain those documents. 
this is a, a totally ridiculous situation in my view. I mean, it, this is not a defense of the Iranian government, but any anybody that accuses any nation or any, any person should give that nation or that person the opportunity to confront the actual accuser or the actual documents, but that's not the case in, in, in this case. Hey, that's the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> All right, yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> Mohammed Sahimi, everybody. Thank you very much.